All right, 2020, we're back. All right, so my point, my, the point I was trying to make here is this, is that at the colon, you have 2,000 reabsorbed, and then your stool is 200. Uh, by, the, by the time you get to the colon, you have 2,200, right? Of that 2,200, 2,000 gets absorbed, 2,000 of water. So we, I'm going to say 2,000 over 2,200 is going to be 90% absorption occurs in the colon. Right? If we're using these numbers, if we're using these numbers. Um, however, don't forget that where does most of the absorption occur? 2,000 compared to what? 5,000? You tell me which number is bigger. That's right, the 5,000. So what I'm trying to say is this, is that most absorption of water occur, occurs in the duodenum and jejunum if we're talking about milliliter. If we're talking about percentage or ratio, then yes, most absorption occurs in the colon, 90%. But but just, this is something, you know, there's discrepancies here, so you have to see what the question is asking you. Is the question asking you about fractions, percentages, or are they asking you about total water being absorbed? All right, and with that, just, just take a break. I guess we're gonna skip the break since, I mean, the other video was cut, was cut short. So let's go into it, the next one, right? Um, bile acid, right? We always talk about bile acid, you know, and how they help us, you know, reabsorb fat, you know, cholesterol, that kind of stuff. Where does bile acid come from? Well, the liver makes bile, and it gives that bile to the gallbladder to store. The bile and the gallbladder, as you can see, gets a little bit more concentrated, right? Now the gallbladder, let's make this very clear. The gallbladder does not make bile. The gallbladder does not make bile. All the gallbladder does is store the bile and concentrate it. The bile is made in the liver and the liver gives the bile to the gallbladder to hold on to so that when we eat, the gallbladder can release it. One of the things you got to know is the composition of bile is that um, the composition of bile is that most of most. So if we were to zoom in into the solid component, we can see that most of the solid component is 64 percent bile acid. And I'm going to talk about what bile acid is later on. Um, just just to quick show you the, the purpose of bile. Um, as you can see, a uh, uh, bile is bile salts are around here, cholesterol is over here. Now bile salts are different from bile acid. Um, this is going to be like uh, what bile acid becomes in the lumen. Um, what's important here is what they're trying to show you here is how cholesterol, the relationship of cholesterol to bile acid and to lecithin is that there is a metastable zone, right? Where cholesterol is able to be basically um, dissolved and not dissolved. There's this area right here is where cholesterol and bile, at, and bile salts meet so that you can have them, uh, the cholesterol being uh, dissolved. And that's where, you know, most of the, our, our gallbladder bile, the composition of our gallbladder bile lies is in this area. As you can see, it's called, it says the metastable zone, but you can see that, that really differences Differences in cholesterol can take it to the saturated zone, and differences in bile can take it to the unsaturated zone. So there is a little, you know, there's a little tightrope here, right? Because bile lies in here. If we start messing around with the bile, we can, we can, we can move around and shift around and go to places that it's not supposed to be. Um, just real quick, so this is basically uh, just. A, PhD stuff for bile acid. Um, here's what I was talking about. Like I said, the gallbladder does not make bile. The liver makes bile, and then the liver gives that bile through the right hepatic duct, through the left hepatic duct, into the common hepatic duct, and, and gives it to the gallbladder to store. Right? The gallbladder is going to concentrate the bile by reabsorbing water, you know, obviously water follows salt, and so that's how it happens. 
and then when the bile, when the when the gallbladder is ready to release the bile, it's going to constrict, contract, and release it into the common bile duct or the bile duct, right? Into the through the sphincter of Odi or uh, yeah, sphincter of Odi into duodenum, right? And then of course we know that the pancreas is attached, you know, somewhere right here. Here's just a little cartoon to kind of emphasize that. Um, the liver, bile, and gallbladder relationship. So like I said, the, the gallbladder concentrates bile, right? So what happens if it concentrates it a little bit too much? Well, we call those gallstones, right? Gallstones. So there is something you guys have to know is that there's a certain um, population of people who are very susceptible to gallstones. And, and, and to memorize that, we have something called the four Fs, right? People who are fat, 40, female, and fertile are most likely to have gallstones, right? And gallstones we call cholelithiasis. So chole is, you know, when we say chole, we're talking about the gallbladder. And and then when we say lithiasis, lith, you guys remember what the otolith is? The otolith in your, you know, your, your semicircular canals or whatever. Lift is just a, like, I think it's Greek for stone. So gallbladder stones, right, or gallstones. And this is, and uh, what happens when you have gallstones? Here's the gallbladder. When you have gallstones, these stones can block the gallbladder exit, right? The content, the bowel from being excreted into the, you know, the common hepatic duct. Um, and when that happens, this is what you guys have to know. Whenever you block a tube, whenever you block a tube, that means that everything behind that tube is prone to infection. And when this gallbladder gets infected and it gets inflamed, we call that coli for gallbladder cystitis, right? Cyst because the gallbladder is kind of like a pouch, a sac. And then itis means for inflammation, right? So gallstones, gallstones can cause cholecystitis, right? Inflammation of the gallbladder. What happens when you have cholecystitis? People present with Murphy sign. Murphy sign is when you put your hands right underneath the right rib cage, and you tell them to take a deep breath in. You're going to stop mid breath and wince with pain. This is basically how it works. Um, as you put your, your, your hand right there underneath the right coastal margin um, and you breathe in, you're going to contract your diaphragm, right? You're going to contract your diaphragm. As the diaphragm moves down, it's going to push the liver and the gallbladder down towards your fingers. When you push it towards your fingers, the gallbladder is going to touch your fingers and ouch, it's going to hurt, right? This is a really good image of how it works. Again, you put your hand there. When you tell the person to breathe out, I mean to, to breathe in, when they breathe in, the diaphragm goes down, and then the gallbladder, the inflamed gallbladder touches your hand, and that's how that works. Uh, so with that background, let's go ahead and look at this question and answer it. All right, the, page, the question is asking about a 55-year-old overweight woman who is being examined for excessive flatulence during a physical exam. Her abdomen is being Pressed upwardly along the right subcoastal margin. During inspiration, she winces while her respiration momentarily ceases. This suggests the answer here is cholecystitis, right? This is going to be secondary. This should be secondary to cholelithiasis, right? Because she matches the four Fs, right? We said that the four Fs are someone who is fat, someone who is female, and usually in their 40s. So she's a little bit older. And then the fourth F is fertile, right? Um, so she has, I mean, she has like about, she has three of these, right? 55-year-old, um, not, not 40, but she's fat and a woman. So she most likely has cholithiasis. So you're going to block the gallbladder with these stones. And when you block the gallbladder with these stones, you're going to cause the gallbladder to be prone to infection. You get the infection, you get this inflammation of the gallbladder. 
the inflammation in the gallbladder causes cholecystitis. Cholecystitis causes Murphy's sign. All right, and then um, so what is bile a uh, bile acid and the difference between bile acid and bile salts? Let me just check something out. Right. Okay, so a bile acid is this. Um, the bile acid, as I said, it gets made in the liver. What the liver does is attach a glycine or a taurine. That's high yield. Attaches a glycine or a taurine to this molecule and conjugates it, right? Um, so when you attach the glycine and taurine, we call that conjugation. We call the attachment of glycine and taurine to, to this molecule conjugation. And this is officially your bile salt. I'm sorry, your, yeah, your, your bile acid. The bile acid, right? Um, then the bile acid, it gets, you know, the gallbladder, it, you know, then you give it to the gallbladder, and then the gallbladder stores it, concentrates it, and then when it's ready for the gallbladder to contract because of CCK, it's going to dump out the bile into the duodenum, and then what's going to convert the bile, the bile salt into the bile What's going to convert convert the bile acid into the bile salt? The people that do that, and this is going to be via deconjugation. To go from bile acid to to go from bile acid to bile salt, you do this via deconjugation. And the people who are in charge of deconjugation are going to be bacterial. Bacteria. So bacteria in the lumen of your duodenum, once they get this bile acid, they're going to deconjugate it and form bile salt. So with that background, go ahead and answer this question. All right, so the answer for this is going to be... Uh, See, they're converted, and 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 so if this question were to say, what in the duodenum converts bile acids to bile salt? The answer would be bacteria. If they ask you what's the reaction that does it, the answer would be deconjugation. Here's just some you know composition of bile. Um, as you can see right here, uh, just a little high yield here, water um, is obviously an ingredient of bile. You have 97.5% water of liver bile. And then like I said, the liver gives the bile to the gallbladder and then the gallbladder is going to concentrate it. Um, and like I said, CCK is an, important is an important molecule because CCK is getting released by the eye cells. Through what what makes them release it is fat and amino acids, and um, you're going to act on these vagal afferents to tell the brain that hey, um, let's digest this stuff, and the brain's going to use these vagal efferents and release acetylcholine on the gallbladder, telling it to contract and release the bile, and it's also going to tell the sphincter of OD to relax so that the bile can have an open door to come out. So, let me ask you something. Um, someone who has an inflamed gallbladder, someone who has an inflamed gallbladder, CCK will hurt them, right? Because CCK is calling the gallbladder to contract. So if this gallbladder was, was inflamed, the last thing you want is for it to constrict, contract, because that's going to hurt. So what are you going to tell people who, who um, have an inflamed gallbladder? You're probably going to tell them to stay away from fat. Uh, this is just um, okay. So, so most of bile gets recycled. Most of our bile gets recycled, and this is just Dr. Littleton explaining that how you know we, we make the bile, we make we make the bile, and then we give it to the gallbladder. Then the gallbladder is the one that dumps it out, and then we you know it goes all across this. Most of our bile gets reabsorbed. We absorb the bile, and then it goes back through the through the blood system, and it goes back to the liver, so that we can uh, you know use use up that bile again. Just high yield, just a little high yield thing, right? 
And uh, here's just the pathway behind that uh, that Dr. Littleton basically um, has about bile with respect to bilirubin. Um, so bilirubin is a product of degradation of your red blood cells. Um, basically, you have this is just a diagram of that. Uh, this is uh, let me just talk about it first, and then you guys can, can get on top of red blood cells. How long do red blood cells last in your body? 120 days, right? After 120 days, where do they go to die? That's right, the spleen. You guys know what kills them in the spleen? That's right, macro macrophages. Um, and then one of the the products of that is going to be hemoglobin, right? Because obviously hemoglobin is inside the red blood cell. And then it's going to make like protein, like amino acid, and then you're going to have uh, the heme group. And then the heme group is going to get broken down into iron, into iron. And then you're also going to have um, uh, unconjugated unconjugated bilirubin, right? Just to be clear, unconjugated bilirubin is also known as indirect bilirubin. And I'm just going to you know, write this as unconjugated bilirubin. So the unconjugated bilirubin, it's not soluble. It's not soluble in water. It's fat soluble. So we got to attach it to something so it can, you know, go through the blood. And that something is going to be albumin. Right? So the unconjugated bilirubin and the albumin, which is a protein found in our blood, um, both of them go together holding hands towards the liver. What does our liver do? Our liver is going to convert this unconjugated bilirubin, our liver converts unconjugated bilirubin into conjugated bilirubin. And then this conjugated bilirubin is given, is, is mixed into the bile. And of course the bile goes where? Goes to the gallbladder for storage. And then the gallbladder dumps the bile into you know, all that kind of stuff. So when the conjugated bilirubin gets into the GI tract, it's acted on by bacteria. And bacteria convert this conjugated bilirubin into what we call urobilinogen, urobilinogen. And then this urobilinogen, a couple things happen to it. One, it gets, it gets broken down and gets converted into stercobilin. And stercobilin is what gives feces its brown color. Urobilinogen, bilinogen is also reabsorbed back into the blood back into the blood, it's reabsorbed back into the blood, and, and some of it goes to the kidneys, and at the kidneys it gets converted into urobilin, and then urobilin gets excreted from the kidneys, and then that's what gives urine its yellow color. And then the other urobilinogen goes back towards So that's what he's saying in these two slides right here. As you can see, as I mentioned, you have the unconjugated bilirubin that's going to be attached to the albumin to be transported in the blood. It's going to enter the um, the liver. This is the this is a hepatocyte. This is supposed to be hepatocyte. This is supposed to be a hepatocyte. Um, it enters the liver and it and it goes from unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, albumin and conjugated bilirubin, it gets converted to uh, conjugated bilirubin. Okay, so this is the hepatocyte, right? The albumin unconjugated bilirubin goes into the liver and it becomes conjugated bilirubin. The conjugated bilirubin leaves the liver through the bile and goes to the gallbladder and then the gallbladder dumps it out through the biliary system into the blood. I mean, I'm sorry, into the GI as conjugated bilirubin and then the conjugated bilirubin is acted on by bacteria and then the conjugated bilirubin becomes urobilinogen and then I already told you guys that urobilinogen 
become stercobilin. Stercobilin is what you know makes makes uh, feces brown. You know, and then some of it um, goes to the kidneys, and it becomes urobilin, which makes you know your urine yellow. And then some of it goes back into the bloodstream, which goes back into the, the liver. And that's again, that's that's what this diagram is showing as well. Um, that's what this diagram is showing as well. Again, uh, we have the the protein bound bilirubin. Free bilirubin is another way of saying unconjugated bilirubin, and it's protein bound, right? And that protein is going to be albumin. And then it goes to the liver. The liver converts it to conjugated bilirubin. And then the conjugated bilirubin goes into the gallbladder. And then the conjugated bilirubin gets excreted with the bile, you know, through and then into the GI. And then the conjugated bilirubin is acted on by bacteria and it's converted into urobilinogen. That urobilinogen can become stercobilin, which gives, you know, feces its brown color. And it can also go back into the liver and it can also go into the kidneys and be converted into urobilin, which gives you know urine its yellow color. So with that background, let's go ahead and answer this question. So basically the question is saying, jaundice due to an increase in serum conjugated bilirubin is in the form of urobilinogen, right? Because because like I said, one of the fates one of the fates of urobilinogen is to is to go back is to go back into the bloodstream. And this urobilinogen, if it goes back, you know, it, it, it contains bilirubin. So if it goes back into the bloodstream, a lot of it goes into back into the bloodstream, then you're going to have jaundice, which means you know, it, jaundice is also known as icterus, which is basically you know you have elevated levels of, you know, bilirubin. Well, you know, and, and then that makes you yellow. Makes you yellow. All right, guys, so I'm going to wrap this up. One thing I do want to talk about is um, SF3 against, you know, regards to SF2 and all that. I know uh, uh, SF3 is just as hard as SF2. I know a lot of mentors tell their people, oh, SF3 is much more easier than SF2. It's not. The only thing that changes is the content, the time you put in. If you want to honor this unit and do great, and do great second year, this unit is a good is a good uh, is a good litmus test to see how ready you, you can you can prepare yourself for second year. SF three is a bunch of organ systems. You guys have to take if you guys are able to master this unit, you guys will do much more better in second year. SF three contains GI, renal, endocrine, reproductive. Those are all organ systems that we, you know, have to master for step one. And you guys have those broken down into units next year. From here on out, one of the things I recommend is definitely watching out, checking out these Kaplan videos. Particularly if this guy right here, Conrad Fisher, is teaching them. Um, Conrad Fisher is a really good doctor. He's a professor too. Um, I just like his teaching style. His teaching style, you know, vibes with me. If it doesn't vibe with you, fine. I will check out the First Aid RX videos. But definitely start looking at other resources and how they explain things. A lot of how, the way I approach, you know, teaching this 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 lecture was, you know, the way Conrad Fisher talked about it. He likes to break things down and explains it really well. You know, you're looking at about six videos for GI physiology. Um, the first one's like 40 minutes, but you know, most of it is just him talking about step one. You know, stuff you don't have to know right now. And then some of these are like three minutes and four minutes long. So it's something, if you guys have the time, definitely check out those videos. You should, after watching those videos, you'll probably never get a GI physiology question wrong. And just from here on out, I would just start looking at, you know, Kaplan videos for endocrine, renal, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I just leave you guys with this. Uh, I want to talk about this joke right here. Again, we have the gallbladder here, right? So what's another thing that can happen with the gallbladder? And gallstones, right? So the gallbladder and the gallbladder, you know, it can block its own duct and it can form the cholecystitis. The gallbladder can also block that sphincter of Odie. These gallstones, right? These gallstones can get so big that it blocks the sphincter of Odie. 
Guess what else uses the sphincter of odium? The pancreas, right? The pancreas also uses the sphincter of odium. So if you block that sphincter of OD or that common duct, that, that bile duct that both the pancreatic duct and the bile duct both go into, guess what happens? All those pancreatic enzymes, all of those proteinases, those peptidases, those lipases stay in the pancreas and they get activated in the pancreas. And that's not good because guess what they're going to chew up? The pancreas. So with that knowledge, go ahead and answer this question. So basically it's saying a 67-year-old male with history of periodic epigastric pain presents to the emergency room complaining of abdominal distension with some diarrhea with steatorrhea. A history shows no evidence of alcohol use or drugs. Serum amylase and lipase are found to be greater than normal, leading to a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. Laparoscopic examination revealed the probable cause of the pancreatitis was. So are we supposed to have elevated amylase and lipase in our blood? Where do these guys come from? Well, we have pancreatic lipase and we have pancreatic amylase. Those guys belong in the gut, in the GI system, not in our blood. So what this is saying is that the pancreas is inflamed and it's releasing all of its enzymes out into the bloodstream because of the pancreatitis. But what's causing the pancreatitis though? Remember what I said, the gallbladder, then you have the hepatic, common hepatic, the, the gallbladder, goes like this, and then the pancreas uses the exact same bile duct that the gallbladder uses. If this gallbladder has stones, it can block, these stones can impede right here, this, this gallbladder duct right here, and cause inflammation of the gallbladder, you know, cholecystitis, or these stones can skip all of this, and it can go, these stones can skip this, and it, these stones can go and block the ampulla right here. Ampulla is a fancy word for opening in, in, you know, in, in anatomy. And if it blocks that, then all of those, all of those, you know, all of those pancreatic enzymes that are in the pancreas, when they get released, they can't go into the into the, the duodenum. So what happens is they stay right there. And when they stay right there, they start to chew up and destroy the duodenum. And then they can also get into, they can get into the bloodstream, right? And, and that's not good because they're not supposed to be there. So what's causing this guy's pancreatitis and what's causing him to have pancreatic enzymes in his blood? And that's going to be D. A gold bladder stone in the ampule. Again, just to emphasize what I was saying, just some really good advice from here on out to finish off the year strong. If you haven't got first aid already, get it, please. It's even the electronic version in your Dropbox. You're going to buy it eventually for second year. The second year is right. Is, is, you're going to be a second year this year. Also, if you, ha if you have time, check out the Kaplan videos. Obviously, doing old questions is more important than anything. But if you have trouble understanding some of these lectures, see what Kaplan has to say. Kaplan has a bunch of videos that are, that are broken down. And uh, yeah, just definitely check that out. So, I mean, thanks for watching what I had to say about GI and Good luck. Study hard.